Okay, the, uh, okay, let me go through the questions here. Uh, the group quizzes, I'm going to input the scores on those um, in time, just as I go along. Um, so pretty soon I'll get um, those updated. Um, thanks for the reminder uh, about the recording. Okay, what lab is due? Uh, okay, if you missed it, it's the measurement lab is due and um, the Charles Law. Though I wanted to talk about the graph because I wanted everybody to have the same um, style of graph. And so we're going to do the graph together, the Charles Law. I posted a link in Piazza, so it should be live. Let me make sure. But yeah, thanks for the reminder. Otherwise, this is the link. Okay, it's working. All right, so uh, since I didn't record this, uh, we're working on number 150, you know, 694 milligram sample of impure sodium car carbonate. So 694 milligrams means that uh, there's some uh, milligrams of pure sodium carbonate plus some milligrams of impure impurities. And the impurities are, you know, various things. And that's going to total up to 694 milligrams. When we add HCl to this, we're adding hydrochloric. We have to assume that the impurities do not react. You know, um, so the impurities might be something that's, uh, that's uh, inert to HCl. And um, therefore, like sodium chloride, you know, sodium chloride is not really, table salt is not going to react with HCl, something like that, or, or sodium iodide or something where we don't have any driving force for reaction. And we look for different types of reactions. We look for the possibility of metathesis, acid base, and redox reactions. And so as long as those, because HCl does have metathesis, acid base, and redox properties. And so we, we have to be aware of that. And so in this particular instance, we, we need to make this assumption. We assume that the HCl does not react with impurities. Sometimes we have impurities that are reactive. And so that complicates things much more. But if the HCl only reacts with the sodium carbonate, then we can figure out how much sodium carbonate we had in there stoichiometrically, as long as we track how much HCl we use. And so when we track it, this titration, titration is like a precise and accurate measure of how much was required to react. And so this would be a precise and accurate measure of how much HCl was required to react with all the sodium carbonate. And it turned out it's 41.24 milliliters of 0.244 molar hydrochloric acid was required to react with all the sodium carbonate. And so as long as we have the balanced chemical equation, we can figure out you know, how many milligrams of, of sodium carbonate we have. And so we could either go grams or we could go milligrams. It doesn't matter. Percent by mass is going to give us this equation. So let's take a look at the equation for percentage by mass. And so if we're looking at um, sodium carbonate, so percent sodium carbonate is going to be the mass of sodium carbonate. It doesn't matter the units. It could be milligrams, grams, pounds, whatever, over the total mass times 100%. Now we know what the total mass is. The total mass is 694 milligrams. And so I think what we want to do is we want to calculate the milligrams of sodium carbonate that's present in there divided by 694 milligrams of total mass. Times 100%. All right, so uh, we have the denominator. The numerator here, we're just going to get by stoichiometry. And so we know how much HCl reacted. Therefore, we can easily figure out how much sodium carbonate reacts. And so the sodium carbonate is going to react with um, HCl. This is a double replacement reaction. On uh, this, we're going to form sodium chloride and hydrogen carbonate. Hydrogen carbonate is carbonic acid. And so we'll produce sodium chloride. And we know that carbonic acid, um, we know that carbonic acid decomposes spontaneously to H2O liquid plus CO2 gas. 
carbonic acid is very unstable, or hydrogen carbonate, you know, carbonic acid. And so it's going to decompose. So we're going from stronger acid, HCl, to weaker acid, you know, CO2. CO2 is uh, Lewis acid. And, um, and um, also we're forming a gas. And so the driving force of metathesis is, you know, stronger acid, weaker acid, gas formation or precipitation. Sodium chloride does not precipitate. In fact, this is aqueous. Sodium salts are all aqueous. HCl is aqueous. Sodium chloride is aqueous. Water is a liquid. CO2 is a gas. And so to balance this, we'll need two HCLs, two NaCLs, and then this is balanced here. So uh, stoichiometry, we're going to start off with uh, milliliters of HCl solution. So we're going to go milliliters. Actually, maybe I'll go a different color here. And so milliliters of solution to liters of solution, then liters of solution to moles of pure HCl. As we have the molarity here. And then from moles of pure HCl to moles of sodium carbonate. Here. And then from moles of sodium carbonate to grams of sodium carbonate to milligrams of sodium carbonate. Then once we get the milligrams of sodium carbonate, we'll plug it in here, divided by 694 times 100%, and then we'll get the percentage sodium carbonate in there. And so it's just because the HCl only reacts with the sodium carbonate, so we can figure out how much sodium carbonate we had based on how much HCl reacted. And they give us how much HCl reacted, you know, 41.24 milliliters of this 0.244 molar HCl solution um, reacted. So this is a, a titration style problem. Titration is just trying to figure out stoichiometrically how much, you know, how much re, uh, was required for reaction, how much whatever is really required. In this case, how much HCl was required for this reaction. So let's just see what they did here. So they have the balanced chemical equation here. They didn't put the states. So I always put the states on there. It's important to get in the habit of putting the states in here. So this is a bad habit to get into, especially in Chem 1A. If you do this in Chem 1A, it's a bad habit. Um, you don't have to write aqueous. Aqueous, you know, um, in Chem 1A, uh, I don't, and also in Chem 4, I don't make the students write aqueous. Uh, um, we assume it's aqueous if there's nothing written there. But liquid solids and gases, I expect them to write always. And so here's this is taken as aqueous, aqueous, aqueous. That's a liquid gas. And so if there's nothing written, we assume it's aqueous. Uh, if it's not aqueous, then we have to write the state there. Um, they'll save you a little time, you know, rather than that. But if you do write aqueous, you have to write it for every one that's aqueous. You can't just write it for one and ignore the others. All right, so let's see what they did here. Uh, they did uh, milliliters of solution to liters of solution, liters to moles of pure HCl, moles of pure HCl to moles of pure sodium carbonate, moles of pure sodium carbonate to grams of sodium carbonate, grams to milligrams. And then they plugged it in. So this is step one here, you know, and this, this step equals 533 milligrams according to their calculation. 533 milligrams of sodium carbonate. And then in step two, they calculate the percent by mass. The percent by mass is, you know, the mass of sodium carbonate over the total mass, which would be the mass of the sample times 100%, which gives us 76.8% here. A student received a 599 milligram sample of a mixture. Okay, again, another mixture. This previous problem was a mixture problem, you know. Um, and so here we have another mixture problem of sodium hydrogen phosphate and sodium dihydrogen phosphate. She is to find the percentage of each compound in the sample. After dissolving the mixture, she titrated it with 19.58 milliliters of um, 0.201 molar sodium hydroxide. If the only reaction is the sodium dihydrogen phosphate plus sodium hydroxide yields sodium monohydrogen phosphate plus water, find the required percentages. Right. 
This, um, This particular problem, uh, you know, um, they should have made it a little bit harder. They've made it a little bit harder than um, be a little easier. Do in fact, I thought they had one. But they made it a little easier. Um, we could have, you know, in this in this particular example here, we had an inert impurity, and um, you know, th there this is like a two component mixture. In this two component mixture, sodium carbonate was reactive, and the other component was unreactive. All right, the same thing here. This is a two component mixture. Um, the sodium dihydrogen phosphate they're saying is reactive, and they're saying the sodium monohydrogen phosphate or the sodium hydrogen phosphate is unreactive. And so again, this is just like the previous problem, only one of the components in here, and there could be more than one component, of course, but only one that can be reactive here. Now with a two component mixture, we could have both components react. If both of these react, then we can actually still figure it out. It would be a two equation, um, or two, you know, two equation, two unknown type stoichiometry. Two equation, two unknowns type stoichiometry, you do that in Chem 1A. You'll do two equation, two unknown stoichiometry type problem. And there are different ways you can solve that. I, I, um, I solved those particularly using graphical method. So I wish they had both of these react. If they had both of these react, it would be um, a good problem. But this is kind of funny because you would expect the sodium monohydrogen phosphate to react with a strong base like sodium hydroxide. It should have reacted. They would have to be very careful with this particular one just to add enough to convert it into a monohydrogen and not too much to react. You know, because if they added excess sodium hydroxide, it would have attacked the monohydrogen. First, it would attack the dihydrogen because it's a stronger base. Then after all that's gone, then the sodium hydroxide being powerful base, I mean, stronger acid, sorry, the dihydrogen phosphate is stronger acid, reacting with a powerful base. And so um, after the stronger acid's done, depleted, then the, the, the powerful base is gonna look for the next strongest acid, which would be the monohydrogen. So it, it will attack the monohydrogen if there's enough sodium hydroxide. So they're carefully controlling this. A reaction to stop at the neutralization of the dihydrogen, but not attacking the second hydrogen on there. And so um, this is the same kind of deal here. We have a 599 milligram mixture and only one component is, um, is reactive. And so we can figure out the percentages here. And so it's going to be 599 milligrams. And the sample is going to contain two um, components. And so we're going to be able to figure out the percentage of both components because both of them have to add up to 100%. And so the reactive component is we don't, we have some grams of, um, actually, this is milligrams too. So we have some kind of milligrams of um, dihydrogen phosphate. And we have some milligrams of monohydrogen phosphate. And the monohydrogen phosphate is not going, it, uh, is not going to react. It, this is a carefully controlled reaction. So it's carefully controlled. And so we assume that this does not react. Assume this does not react under these conditions. For sure, it would have reacted under. If you did this normally, it probably you probably wouldn't neutralize that one too. Assume this does not react in this problem. Again, I, I kind of wish they would have um, they would have had both react, and uh, it would have been a more interesting problem. So they're just adding one HCl. I'm gonna emphasize that by putting one here and it's gonna attack the stronger acid first. Or so one NaOH, sorry, NaOH. 
It's going to attack the stronger acid first, NaOH. This one. And so if, if this one doesn't react here, then, um, then uh, the NaOH reacts with this, and here's the equation. And so we could figure out how many milligrams of dihydrogen phosphate were in there just by seeing how much NaOH reacted. And so again, it's going to just be, um, we're going to go from 19.58 milliliters of solution to liters of solution um, to moles of pure sodium hydroxide because we have the molarity here. And then from moles of that to moles of this, it's a one to one mole ratio, and then to grams of this, and then to milligrams of this. And then we're going to plug that into our equation. Our equation is going to be percent um, sodium dihydrogen phosphate by mass. This is an M over M percentage. This is just going to be the mass of uh, uh, the dihydrogen, sodium dihydrogen phosphate divided by the total mass. The total mass is given 599 milligrams total. And so we need milligram mass times 100%. We're going to get that here I mean, um, from the stoichiometry and we'll just plug it in up here. So exact same problem as the last one. So milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution to, uh, they go with millimoles, I don't like that. I will go milliliters to liters, liters to moles, moles to moles, moles to grams, grams to milligrams. I don't like to, to do this myself, but if you're into it, that's fine. So we get this minute in the milligrams and then plug it into the percent by mass equation here. And so it comes out to 78.8% of the dihydrogen phosphate. Now, what percentage was the unreactive portion? Well, there was only one component, and that was this monohydrogen phosphate. So the rest must be monohydrogen phosphate. So these two must total up to 100%. If both of these reacted in this reaction, we still could have figured it out. It would have just um, been a little bit more complex because we would have had just another equation. And then we could either um, combine equations or we could do something called the graphical method to figure it out but they made it easy that this one doesn't react, you know, and then all, all, all we could figure out this component quite easily. A chemist combined 60.0 milliliters of 0.322 molar potassium iodide with 20.0 milliliters of 0 0.530 molar lead to nitrate. Yeah, this is why I'm camping. All right, so how many grams of lead to iodide will precipitate? Okay, so again, this is a um, limiting reagent. Whenever they give you both reagents, so they give us 60 milliliters of 0.322 molar potassium iodide and 20 milliliters of 0.530 molar lead to nitrate. And so we don't know which one of these two are the limiting reagents. So we have to figure out which one's limiting reagent. And so we'll just get the equation for this. It's potassium iodide, which is Ki, reacting with lead to nitrate, which is PdNO3. Two. And this is going to form potassium nitrate, KNO3, and lead to iodide, PBI2. Um, lead to iodide is a solid, you know, chlorides, iodides, and bromides are insoluble except for, uh, or soluble, excuse me, except for um, silver, lead, and mercury. So this is insoluble in the precipitate. So we have a driving force. So we'll just need to balance it. And so we, we, the first calculation is we're going to figure out the yield of precipitate from the potassium iodide. And so, you know, calculation one will go milliliters of solution to liters of solution, liters to moles of Ki, moles of Ki to moles of P 
PBI2 and the moles of PBI2 to grams of um, PBI2. That uh, would be calculation one. And then um, we'd compare that to calculation two. Calculation two, we're gonna have milliliters of lead to nitrate. Um, so milliliters of this solution, 20 milliliters, um, going to liters, going to moles. Yeah. And then from moles, to moles here and the moles to grams. And then we compare these two grams, see which one's smaller. And so it's your standard. This is a standard chemistry calculation. A limiting reagent problem like this is standard stoichiometry calculation. And so here are the two calculations, starting with the Ki, 60 milliliters solution, Ki solution to liters, liters to moles, moles to moles here, moles to grams, so 4.45 grams. It's a one to two mole ratio here. And then we go to the light nitrate, uh, the PB, um, lead to nitrate, 20 milliliters lead to nitrate, to liters, to moles. And this is a one to one mole ratio, and then to grams, and then see which one's a smaller amount. 4.45 is what we call the theoretical yield. You know, that's how much in theory we can form from this reaction. So this is the theoretical yield, Ty. This is an impossible, we can't have that. This is the LR, limiting reagent. Limiting reagent is 60 milliliters of Ki solution. This is the excess reagent here. So we don't need that much here. All right, what is the final molarity of the potassium ion? Okay, the um, final molarity of the potassium ion, um, we have to figure out what that is. Um, this is uh, what we call solution dilution. Potassium is a spectator here, you know, and um, we need the ionic equation to see what's happening with the potassium. So let's take a look at the ionic equation here. So if they're asking us potassium ions, then we need the ionic equation to see what's going on with all the ions and stuff. So we had two KCLs plus PBNO3, two yields KNO3, two KNO3s plus PBI2. This is a solid, and so this is a precipitate. All these are aqueous, so I'm going to omit the aqueous just to save a little bit of time and um, leave it like that. Now, the ionic equation, we ionize the strong electrolytes. Potassium chloride is a strong electrolyte. It's a soluble salt. So that's gonna give us two potassiums plus two chlorides, or two iodides, it's not chloride, it's iodide, potassium iodide, two iodides. This is a soluble salt. All nitrate salts are soluble. That's gonna give us PB2 plus, plus two nitrates. And then um, potassium salts and nitrate salts are all soluble. So this is two potassiums plus two nitrates. So it'll ionize. This is an insoluble salt. And so the, the potassium ion concentration does not change. K plus is a spectator. Um, therefore, its concentration does not change. And so whatever concentration it was, um, it's still going to be the same. Now, this is a challenge problem because of this. Whenever we mix two solutions, we're gonna have solution dilution here. And so let's figure out what the potassium ion concentration was in the original potassium iodide here. Clear all these drawings. 
And so uh, initially I had 60 milliliters of 0.322 molar potassium iodide. And so this is 60.0 milliliters of 0.322 molar Ki. Well, what does Ki consist of? For every Ki, we have one potassium and one iodide. And so when we have Ki, you know, aqueous, it's soluble, it splits up. This is strong electrolytes. So strong electrolytes split up into potassiums and iodides. And it's one to one, it's a one to one to one. So for every Ki that we have, we get one potassium and one iodide. And so what that means is, is this, we can use this as our conversion factor. That is, if we have 0.322 molar Ki, then we know we have one mole of potassium ions for every one mole of Ki. And so molarity means moles per liter. So the moles of Ki cancel and that leaves us with moles of potassium ions per liter. And so th what this is gonna give us is gonna give us 0.322 molar potassium ions. And so that's what we have here. We have 0.322 molar potassium ions and we have 0.322 molar iodide ions. Now the situation with this problem is we're adding another solution. So to this, we're gonna add 20 milliliters of stuff. And so at the end of this, we're, we're gonna have a volume of 80 milliliters. So even though the potassium ions don't do anything, they're being diluted, the volume is being diluted. And so this turns into a solution dilution problem. That is, what is the dilution factor? And so the molarity two is equal to V1 over V2 times molarity one, where V1 over V2 is the dilution factor. Or in other words, M, M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2, solve for M2. And so V1 is 60.0, 60 .0. that's our initial volume. And that's what the potassium iodide was originally. But then our final volume is gonna be 80. And so it's gonna be a 60 to 80 dilution. And what was the original molarity? The original molarity was 0.322 molar. And so it's a 60 to 80 or, um, Let's see what it comes out to, or six, uh, let's, let's multiply it out, this is. So 60, you know, times 0.322 divided by 80, uh, or six eighths, 0.2415 molar. And so after dilution, it's gonna be 0.2415 molar. It doesn't react. If it reacted, then you know we'll have to uh, factor that in as well. But it didn't react, and so it's just a straight solution dilution. All right. All right. What they did was they uh, did a little table here. Um, little stoichiometry table. You know, the limiting reagent was the potassium iodide. Yeah. And potassium iodide is gonna make the KNO3. So they figured out how many moles of KNO3 they made. And based on that, um, they divided by the total volume at the end. 80 milliliters or 0.08 liters. So this is how they did it. What is the final molarity of lead two or iodide ion, whichever one is in excess? So um, which one came out in excess? Well, um, the Ki was a limiting reagent. The lead two nitrate was the excess reagent. And so you could use a table like this as well to figure out the molarity at the end. I do the solution dilution right at the beginning. Um, they didn't, they, they did a mole table. 
And so when I do this type, this type of table we use in Chem 1B, but we don't use moles, we use molarity. And therefore you have to do the solution dilution right at the beginning. Solution dilution is very common calculation in Chem 1B. This is why this equation is very um, familiar to me. I have this one well memorized because I use it so many times. Because when we're mixing, you know, when you mix chemicals, you automatically end up diluting the chemicals. So that's why this, this equation is so common. I, I would have done this problem differently um, than probably the way they would have done it. You know. But basically, um, when we try to figure out how much excess reagent remains, you know, uh, then we start off with the limiting reagent. And so we already figured out what the limiting reagent was. The limiting reagent's um, potassium iodide. And so um, for this particular calculation, the first thing I, I calculate would be um, how much, you know, how much um, lead to nitrate um, was consumed, um, but you know, how much is usually grams, but since we're dealing with moles and molarity, they want the molarity, they're, they're for moles, the, rather than grams, you know, normally I say, you know, how many grams were consumed by the limiting reagent. Well, what we can say here is how many moles, how many moles of lead to nitrate, how many moles of lead to nitrate um, were, uh, or was, were consumed, how many moles were consumed by the, by the LR? Well, then we start off with a limiting reagent. The limiting reagent here is um, 60.0 milliliters of Ki solution. And what was the molarity of the Ki? Go scroll back up. 0.322. So we're going to convert that to liters. and then to moles of pure Ki. Using the molarity, 0.322 moles of Ki per liter of solution. So the solution cancels out. We are left with moles of pure Ki. And then from the balance chemical equation, we know that we have one mole of lead to nitrate for every um, two moles of Ki. All right, this is going to tell us how many moles were consumed by the limiting reagent, you know, um, just, just based on the limiting reagent, um, 60 divided by 1,000 times 0.322 divided by 2, 0.00963. Three sig figs, so nine six zero zero moles um, consumed. This is moles of PB NO three two consumed lead to nitrate. Well, how many moles did we start off with? And so we got to figure out how many moles we had initial initial moles. PB NO3 2. Well, initially uh, we had 20.0 milliliters of PB NO3 2 solution. And then we'll just convert that to liters. And then we'll convert it to moles based on the molarity. So let's figure out the molarity or let's see what the molarity was, 0 0.530, 0 0.530, mole of 
moles of pure PBNO3, two per liter of solution. So that's how much we had before any reaction took place, you know, um, in the container. And so it's going to be 20 divided by 1,000 times 0 0.53, 0 0.0106. So initially at the start, we had 0 0.0106. Um, we're allowed three sig figs, so we'll just carry one moles of PBNO3 initial. And so we're going to um, figure out the moles. Okay, so here. So I'm doing this one here, um, two, three. Moles of PBNO3, two, remaining unreacted. Unreacted. Here. And so it's the initial moles, 0 0.0106 moles initial minus 0 0.009600 moles consumed by the LR, by the limiting reagent. And so it's 106 minus 96, which is gonna be 10. And so this is gonna be 0 0.0010. Okay, we're only allowed um, four decimal places here. And so I'll subscript one like that. In other words, we're only, we only get two sig figs from this calculation. And so moles remaining. So if we have that many moles remaining, well, the, the solution volume did change. And the molarity of the, um, of the lead to nitrate that's unreacted will equal the moles remaining, 0 0.001000 moles, divided by the total volume. Now, the total volume is going to be, we mix the, the 60 plus the 80. And so that's going to be 0.0, I mean, 60 plus the 20, which gives us 80. So 0 0.080, um, how many sig figs was that? Three, I guess, um, liters. And so I, t I converted 80 milliliters into liters here in my head. And so it's gonna be, um, divided by 0.08. 0.0125 molar. And so this means um, we're going to have 0 0.0125 molar PB NO3 in the final product mixture. So this is an unreacted product mixture. So let's see what they did here. Oops, the wrong one. Let's see what they did here. Uh, they got 0010 moles of PBNO32 um, because they took it from this table here. And so um, they did some calculations here. They didn't show the calculations. The calculations, we did the calculations here. The moles initial. PBNO3, 0 0.0106. The moles consumed by the LR is this one, 0 0.0096. They got 965, I got 960. I'm not sure what the discrepancy there is. Um, but anyway, this if they use 965, you don't get this. It would have been 0 0.0009, so that's weird. It's all right. I'll just skip the uh, discrepancy there because I don't want to waste time finding it. I think they made a mistake. But anyway, uh, let's go on to the next problem. A solution is defined at, oh, actually we didn't do this one. Uh, we didn't. 
A solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture. Is a small sample of air a solution? Yeah, uh, air is homogeneous, you know, it looks uniform. Anything that looks hom uniform is hom homogeneous, whether it's a mixture or pure. Is the atmosphere a solution? Well, the atmosphere, it, it could have clouds. If it has clouds, then it's heterogeneous. If there's smoke or dust, it's heterogeneous. So atmosphere is not necessarily homogeneous. And they say um, air is homogeneous. Um, the atmosphere is very tall and becomes less dense. But yeah, you can't, t you can't see the difference, you know? And so this, this middle sentence doesn't make sense. The atmosphere is therefore not homogeneous, consequently it is not a solution. That's weird. It looks uniform. The air at high altitudes looks the same as the air at low altitude. You can't see the difference, therefore homogeneous and heterogeneous depends on our visual. And so I don't like this answer. If you know either the percentage concentration of a solution or its molarity, what additional information must you have before you can convert? Okay, this is very common conversion, percent by mass. And um, this is a M over M percentage. And so it, this, is, this percentage concentration of molarity, um, we need the density, need density. We can't always assume it's one, you know, like water, because sometimes these solutions are quite concentrated. Like, you know, seawater, you would think it's fairly concentrated, but, you know, it's, it's, it's density is very close to one, you know, it's like two or three percent off. But some of these solutions are highly concentrated, like six molar HCl, you know, or 16, or not, um, 16 molar nitric, or 16 molar um, sulfuric, you know, those are very concentrated. And so, you know, densities are a bit farther off. And so we need the density. We can't always assume it's one, but if we don't have the density, then sometimes we'll just assume it's one. If it's fairly dilute, it's a good assumption, you know, um, like tap water. Tap water is really dilute, so it should be very close to pure water. What additional information? Okay, so the density is it. Order. We did a calculation here, so the density of the solution must be known. All right. All right, that's it for chapter 16. So I'm going to stop talking about um, lecture stuff. And let's go to the lab stuff next. Now, um, if I bring my notes. So the first thing we're going to do is let's take a look at the Charles Law lab. Maybe we'll finish that. Were there any questions on the measurement lab? Measurement lab, I think I did every single calculation for you guys except for one. And so it, I don't think there's much to finish on the measurement lab. All you have to do is write your name on it and turn it in. It should be really easy, um, I would think. Yeah, I think there was only like one calculation I didn't do. Every other calculation I did in class. And so that was it. Um, I'd like to finish the Charles Law, so it'd be good to turn this one in too. And so let's finish up the Charles Law. Um, we'll take a look at the data for Charles Law here. Um, So let's see. Yeah. Let's see what the calculations that we're going to have to do uh, for this are. Actually, maybe, you know what? I'm going to do it on here. It would be better.
No, I didn't. Um, what, what, what was the unknown number on that one? The, um, that one, normally you turn that in blank and then the instructor fills it out for you at the end, unknown number six. Um, all right, so let's, let's take a look at the measurement one. Take a look at the data for that. Or B. You'll have to, can you look up on the video for that? It's, it should be on the video. The measurements and also I posted it on um, Piazza but I don't really have enough time to, to go back through all of them but there it's all there though so um, should be all there all right unknown number six so for unknown number six this is what we got uh, from our calculation and Which lab are we looking at first? Measurement. Measurements? Okay. Yeah. We're looking at measurement lab because um, of this. Normally you leave this blank. Yeah. We leave this blank. And then what happens is the, because the instructor will have the key. And so the instructor is gonna look up the unknown number here in the key and then see what it is. And so when you have, the, when you're gonna do this in Chem 1A, you're gonna have some unknowns that you have to do. Um, you'll write the unknown number here and then you'll get the answer. The answer we got was um, 2.950 grams per milliliter, like that. And then the instructor is gonna look it up in the key and uh, find out what the accepted density is, um, number six. Uh, let's see, do I have that key here? And then um, I'll play, plug it in, but I'm pretty sure this unknown was aluminum. Aluminum um, is 2.70. If this unknown was aluminum, then what is our percent error? So it's experimental 2.95 minus theoretical 2.70 equals divided by theoretical 2.70 times 100%. And so if this, um, if this unknown was aluminum, you know, here, I'll have to, I'll have to verify it because it could have been an aluminum alloy, but for some reason I'm not thinking it was an aluminum alloy because I don't think uh, we have very many alloys. Alloys would, could have a different, um, a different um, density. And so let's say this were aluminum. So the instructor would write 2.70, you know, grams per milliliter, and then calculate the percent error. The percent error came out to 2.3 percent error. Okay. And then you'd receive some grade, you know, there, your grade would be based on how close you got to this. This is kind of high, you know, I would have redone it. And we got a kind of a high error here because we got a 2 percent error here, 2.3 percent error here. To me, this is kind of high as well. We got a, a consistent 2% error. So maybe we have a systematic error. Maybe we're misreading or 
Maybe I was misreading something or maybe something was off, you know, um, giving us this error here. That could be it. You know, something was off. Um, it, it, you normally, we, if we're trying to do very uh, precise and very accurate measurements, we normally calibrate everything. We got to make sure everything's reading correctly, including the graduated cylinder. You know, we got to calibrate everything. The graduated cylinder, the balances, everything. Um, before we start taking measurements, um, to, just to make sure the instruments are properly calibrated. And that could just be even, you know, even a yardstick, you know, if you have a wooden yardstick, it could have shrunk or been damaged in some way. But um, yeah, so I would have filled this in myself for you. So finish that one calculation here and turn this in. You can just scan it and upload it. Piazza. Okay, let's go to the Charles Law lab. Charles Law. Uh, Charles Law Experiment 3. I had it as Experiment 7 or 8 or something like that. Sorry. Um, but it doesn't matter. The numbers are all, the numbers are irrelevant. It's just Charles Law Lab. That's it. Let's see the calculations for this particular lab. So we collected the data for two trials. And so what you'll do is, you know, you have the data in your um, lab notebook. And we want to do the calculations in our lab notebook as well, in case we make an error. And also we want to have a record of the calculations. You know, in case you make an error, you can make a mess out of your lab notebook, but you don't want to make a mess out of your um, report sheet. Okay, so here we got the temperature of the boiling water for trial one, run one, I called it. So we'll just plug that in up here. It's 102.6 degrees. This is a little odd. This shows me that maybe the thermometer wasn't calibrated or there's something odd about it because you know, it shouldn't be boiling this high. And so definitely, but that's what the thermometer was reading. And so therefore that's what we should put on here, but we should have calibrated the thermometers beforehand because if it's misreading like this, we can correct it with a cali you know, calibration correction. The boiling point of water cha changes slightly depending on what the atmospheric pressure is, but we didn't, we didn't correct these. And these are mass produced. These aren't expensive, high precision thermometers. These are cheap thermometers that, you know, if a student breaks it, they aren't going to be um, paying a lot of money out of pocket to replace it. And so we buy cheap ones. And the cheap ones are gonna, um, you know, if you compare your measurement with your neighbors, the cheap ones, you know, they aren't gonna, you're gonna get different measurements, you know, between yours and the neighbor's uh, thermometer in the same beaker. So normally we see up to, you know, one, two, three degrees uh, temperature differences based on the thermometers. Okay, volume of water entering the flask um, was 92.7 milliliters here. Um, volume of the hot air was the total volume of the water. Now for trial one, we had to do a lot of, um, lot of, lot of measurements because I didn't have the large grad cylinders. So this is for trial one, it was 95.3 um, plus 95.8 plus 94.3 plus 94.9 plus 95.4 plus 75.5 milliliters, 551.2 milliliters. And so um, the total volume of the hot air can be determined by um, filling all that volume with water and measuring how much water that was. 
so 551.2 milliliters. Now the experimental volume of air in the flask, you know, um, is going to be based on Charles' law or calculated volume. Experimental experimental volume of air in the flask at T2 V2. And we can that. Experimental volume of air in the flask. Okay. Well, um, this must be the cold air. Um, so we'll probably um, put that here. Cold air. T2V2. Yeah, this is cold air. And so. The, the volume of the cold air is equal to, this you should be writing in your notebook, of course, in case to keep it clean, not on the report sheet. Volume of the cold air is equal to the volume of the hot air minus the volume of the water entering the flask. And so it's going to be the volume of the hot air minus the volume of the water entering the flask of the um, water entering. And so that's going to be 551.2 minus 92.7, which is going to give us the units are milliliters, so I'll just put the milliliters at the end. 551.2 minus 92.7. It's 458.5. 458.5 milliliters. 458.5. So this is the volume of the hot air here. This is the volume of the cold air here. Now we want the calculated volume of cold air in the flask using Charles' law. And so using Charles' law, um, we can just, Charles' law just says that um, V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. So they want us to calculate V2, which we'll say is the cold air. So the volume of the cold air, which is V2, is equal to, uh, just one second. All right, so the volume of the cold air is going to equal um, the uh, volume of the cold is going to equal the temperature of the cold over the temperature of the hot times the volume of the hot. And so the temperature of the cold is, um, <clears throat> this has to be in Kelvin, of course, it's going to be 20, so it's going to be 293 Kelvin. Then the temperature of the hot is 273 plus this is going to be um, 275.6. Um, Although um, we probably should add the 0.12. I'm going to add the point, point 0.2 maybe. So 276.8. 
so here's a case where, you know, I want to change something, but, you know, in, in this case, you know, well, two things, your notebook has to be in ink. Report sheets can be done in pencil. So if you make a, a mistake on a report sheet, you can just erase it. It doesn't have to be permanent because you have a permanent record of your data in your notebook. And so I'm going to add the point two here. So it's 293.2. Uh, because this is 273.15, we'll just round the, the 0.15 to 0.2 since we're going to the nearest tenth here. And the Kelvins are going to cancel, so we'll just cancel out the Kelvins. And then uh, the volume of the hot is 551.2. So based on, this is based on Charles' law, what should the volume of the cold have been? This is the experimental volume of the cold. This is going to be the calculated volume of the cold. And so the calculated volume of the cold is going to be um, um, 551.2. Let's see. We'll got it. 293, 293.2 times 551.2 divided by 276.8. Did I get the, I got it mixed up, sorry, 370, 370, what am I doing? See, uh, again, this is another reason why you want to do the calculations in your lab notebook and not on the report sheet because I made another mistake. The temperature of the cold is, um, is right, 293.2, but the temperature of the hot, I screwed that up because um, I was getting some ridiculous volume. And so the temperature of hot is going to be um, 375, 375.8. So let me write that in here. But even though you do these calculations in your notebook, you have to um, show me the calculations on the report sheet here. I want to see how you got the numbers. And so here we can do that here. It's going to be um, 293.2 Kelvin divided by 375.8. Oh gosh. Let's get that up. 293.2 Kelvin um, divided by 375.8 times 551.2. And so we, um, based on Charles' law, the volume should have gone to not 458, but the volume should have gone to 430.0. How many sig figs are we allowed? Four, zero, um, point zero four, you know, 430.0. Um, zero four, but that's all right. And so you see we're off um, a bit because we have an, an additional 28.5 milliliters. And so now the percent error, the percent error is going to be uh, the, we're going to call this the theoretical. So this is the theoretical. This is the experimental. So percent error is going to be experimental minus um, theoretical divided by the theoretical times 100%. And so the experimental values, um, 458.5 is what we um, measured experimentally, 458.5. And then the theoretical is going to be 430.0. This is in milliliters divided by the theoretical, which is 430 times 100% in one minute. It is break time. But. All right, so we got that. Um, let's go ahead and do the calculation here. So it's going to be 458.5, 458.5 minus 430 equals divided by 430 times 100. 
this is giving us a six point six. Let's see how many sig figs are we allowed here? Three. So six point six two seven percent or six point six three percent. Actually, let's write it here. Six point six two seven percent. And then up here. I'm going to write 6.63 percent um, error. So we're off. Um, we're off by six percent, seven percent. You know what we should have been according to Charles' law. You know the volume should have been even smaller. All right. So I'm going to do trial one. You do trial two. You know you just have to show one representative calculation. So trial two, you're using this. Well, trial two, um, we, we measured it differently. So you could do that, or you could, you could show the representative calculations for trial two as well. Um, but at least show one set of representative calculations. Let me clear these. Professor's uh, break time. Okay. Professor, I have a question. Yes. For ex experimental volume, you said uh, we have to do, um, what was it? Volume of hot air minus volume of what? Oh, the water entering the flask. Oh, entering the flask, okay. Yeah, it's uh, because uh, when we uh, submerged it un in the sink, water got sucked into the flask. Um, because what happens is when the gas, when the air cools, we had the, f the finger over it. When you submerge it in the sink, the, um, the, it gets cold and the volume of the gas contracts. As the volume of the gas contracts, it sucked water into the flask. And so that's what we're measuring, how much water got sucked into the flask. Okay. But it is um, it is break time right now. Right now. So um, does that answer your question, though? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, so what we're gonna we'll do is we let's take a break uh, for fifteen minutes, and then we'll start again after the break. Um, we'll finish this lab here, and then move on to the other labs. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna finish the calculation for trial one. I'm going to do um, this calculation for trial one. And um, we'll do the graph for trial one. And then you do, you just repeat it for trial two. My graph paper didn't come out so nice on the scan. Okay. All right. So let's take a break. Um, let's see what time. So we'll meet back at one o'clock. All right. I'm going to mute and then we'll pause the recording here. Okay, just double checking the calculation. So um, 375, actually it should be 375.8 because I got 102.6 plus 273.2. And so um, divided by 375.8 times 551.2. And so um, what did I have up here earlier? I didn't write it down. This is why. 430. 430. Okay. I still got, and you got 439 point or 429. Well, that 429.9, um, it, it depends on how many digits you carry. So 429.9 versus a 430 is not that significant. Um, okay. I just want to be sure. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it because if you carried more digits, then your answer would be more accurate. You know, sometimes I, I don't clear my calculator. Sometimes I'll just carry extra digits depending on what the last calculation was. And so it depends. Uh, those little factors will um, lead to rounding errors. And those rounding errors can add up. And so um, either my answer is off or your, or your answer is off, but it's no, not. I mean, by changing the 0.9 to 0.8 made it to 430. Okay, then that, that was it. It should be 430.8 though, because you know, officially the the Kelvin temperature. This is why this is why you don't do all your work on on a report sheet. If you did all your work on the report sheet, you know, reports are meant to be given away, and you give this away to somebody and you never get it back. Then you have no record of ever having done it. And so you do all these calculations in your notebook, um, which I should have done. I did. Uh, you know, I, I I made the big mistake because I I didn't want to show it on my notebook here. 
um, this is not an official notebook, but I didn't want to show it on the notebook. I, would, I wanted to show it on the sheet so we know what um, the data was, but normally I just do it in my notebook here so I have a record of it. Unfortunately, I didn't write anything on my notebook and I have no record of all the calculations. So if I need to redo anything, I have to redo the whole thing. Okay, right. I should check it again because um, it looks like other people are getting around 430. So 439.9 is too high. Um, that would be more than just a round off error. That would be um, something else, maybe miskeyed or maybe a misrecorded data. That would be it. So 430, it's okay? Yeah, 430 is good. Okay. First four calculations on D. All right, um, let me just go back to uh, experiment two just to look what Kazer is mentioning here. Um, on bar D, the mass and volume of one drop of water. I did um, those calculations here in my notebook. Uh, I just I just want to know um what, what were the ones for like uh, drops of water added and then uh, massive graduated cylinder plus water I don't know if they were for the same they were the same as number uh, or a no this is a, this is a separate experiment they did the dropper and everything here's my data let's see it take a picture of it can you hold it up one more time so I can take a picture of it please yeah just take a picture of it I, I actually it's in the video I did all the calculations on the video so you can take it and then I did the experiment on the video as well okay thank you um, I did all the calculations for that one Again, this is why you want to have all the calculations in your notebook, so you you have a record of it. You know, um, a lot of Chem Four students they don't do it. They do all the calculations on the report sheet. Um, then you have one source for it. All right, the numbers are different here. Then. So let's go back to experiment three here and then look. Professor? Yes. Uh, for C, for the end of it, uh, for that one, if you uh -huh. scroll up, um, do you want us to find the ounces per inches squared or the milligrams per centimeter squared? Because we did milligrams per centimeter squared from what I remember. Did it ask for ounces too? It. Well, on the paper, it's asking for ounces over inches squared. Ounces per inches squared, yeah. And then just, um, you have to convert it. Let me see. Yeah, whatever ones we didn't do, uh, mass per ounces. Okay, they changed it because I was going off mine. Uh, mine, uh, my paper copy of this was asking for something else different than some. Um, mass in ounces, we could do that based on grams here. You know, the conversion factor, what was the grams? I don't remember, but the it conversion really factor. 7.376 by 10 to negative third. Uh, 
Okay. So it's, a, it's a, this is, um, then that would be um, 7.37 milligrams per square centimeter. And so uh, as far as the gram date to ounces, then it's just 7.376 times 10 to the minus three grams per square centimeter. And then we have to convert the top into ounces and the bottom into square inches. So you, it doesn't matter which one you do first. We can do grams to ounces first. And so um, what we'll do, we could do is just go from grams to pounds. So one pound is 453, 453.6 grams to four sig figs. And then there's exactly 16 ounces in one pound. And so that takes care of the top. Grams cancel, pounds cancel, it gives us ounces. And then the bottom, this goes centimeters squared to inches squared. And so um, we know that there are um, 2.54 centimeters in an inch, exactly. And then just square the whole thing. So 7.37 times 10 to the minus three divided by 453.6 times 16 times 2.54 squared. And uh, I get 1.677 times 10 to the minus three ounces per square inch. These are the conversion. I don't want you guys looking up conversion factors, you know, Googling it, you know, certain things like grams to ounces. You know, somebody will, will do that all the time. Uh, they, they just rely so heavily on Google, but the problem is, is you can't use Google on tests. And if you want to build speed on tests, you got to use the same ones over and over again. It's like doing drills. You know, you do the same drills over and over again. You might think it's repetitive or boring or whatever else, but it actually um, will make you a lot faster in the long run, you know? And so if you have to Google, you know, people are going to Google this all the time. I, I see it all the time. People are going to say, okay, how many ounces in a gram? And so, um, OZ uh, to gram or, you know, um, gram to OZ, you know, and they'll get this and they'll get this number and they'll use this number here for their conversion factor. But what are you going to do on an exam, you know? And so I, this happened on the last test. On the last test, people were Googling conversion factors like this. No, you want to use the same ones over and over again. That way you, there's a better chance that you'll memorize them. And so I wouldn't do this, you know, there are 28 grams in an ounce, you know, or 28 point, dependence on how many sig figs you want. You know. For an approximate result, use 28.35. Well, that, that's going to give you four sig figs. But don't use this unless you want to memorize this. If you want to memorize it, fine. You know, if you have it memorized, that's one thing. If you haven't memorized and you use this a lot, that's fine. But if you don't have it memorized, then, you know, you shouldn't be looking it up. You should go with the ones you have memorized. And at the last resort, go with the ones that you have to look up, you know, either in the book or online. Um... Part of the part part of the lab is to collect the data, and so this is why you know. Otherwise, I wouldn't be going through the lab. I'd just give you the data, you know. And so when I'm doing the lab, I'd like you to collect the data also, and then you have to have it recorded. And so there could be reasons that you missed um, recording the data, but make sure you get it um, as much as as you can. 
If you miss the lab, then make sure you, go, you watch the video and then see the lab. But um, that's the reason I didn't post the data on, on, on Kiats or anything, because it has to be a somewhat realistic lab experience. A somewhat realistic lab experience is actually sitting there and doing the lab, um, you know, virtually um, as much as possible. So. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I got a, a request. Uh, so I, I, I can, um, I can do, I'll, I'll just do it for section D. I, I have a um, message for um, posting the data. Uh, so I'll take a picture of, of section D and then post it on Piazza and then you missed all the data for that. So I'll, I'll post it in, um, later um, to do that. So this is why I, I do it. This is more steps, obviously the more steps, but um, Anyway, and then the same thing here, you know, you go with the ones you know on the squared. Our diver uh, deriving the conversion between Kelvin and Celsius, we already know what the conversion is. <clears throat> You know, if you want the Kelvin temperature, you take the Celsius temperature and then add, um, how much do you add? Well, normally I just add 273, but it depends on how precise and how many figs you want. You know, the actual conversion is 273.15. This is not a conversion factor, this is just algebraic. And so to get the, um, the Kelvin temperature, we take the Celsius temperature and then add 273.15, but most, most people will drop this and just get three sig figs, which is adequate for the calculation, or maybe go one decimal place and add 273.2. X is not unknown. X is known. We know what X is. But what we're going to do is we're going to derive X experimentally. So it's known. We, this is not any mystery. But um, X is to be determined from your experimental data. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, try to determine this 273.15 from our experimental data. And you'll see how we're going to do that in a minute. And we're going to do it in two different ways. Um, one, we're going to do algebraic. And the second method we're going to do is graphic by graphing it. And so let's do the algebraic method first. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a modified version of Charles law here. Solve the following Charles law equation below for the conversion value X. First use your experimental temperatures and volumes, then repeat for trial two. Do not worry about the units for X. Report your answer to three sig figs. So we'll do this for trial one. You know, if we use Celsius, then we have to correct it. And so this would be Charles Law using Celsius with a correction factor. Otherwise it doesn't work. If we just put Celsius in there, um, this, this equation fails. And so we have to put this X in there to correct it. And the X is we need Kelvin temperatures. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna just solve for X. So we're gonna go ahead and put our Celsius temperatures in there. And so T1 was a hot temperature, which was um, the, the hot temperature was Three seventy-five point eight Celsius. Oh, that was Kelvin. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to leave the hot temperature in Celsius, one hundred two point six degrees Celsius. This is plus X. Now we're going to get rid of the units here in a minute, but the units should cancel anyway. And so, the cold temperature was at twenty point zero degrees Celsius plus X. Okay, this is going to equal the. Um, Hot volume, the hot volume was 551.2 milliliters. 
and the cold volume. Um, was 551.2 minus 92.7. I didn't write it down. 551, I did, but I've raised it. 551.2 minus 92.7. The cold temperature, 458.5 milliliters. And so actually the units are going to cancel out here. We'll just go ahead and cancel out. Actually, they would cancel out here because that would be the same. So we're going to just go without the units here. And then um, we'll just try to do this. We're going to just cross multiply here. This equation. So it's going to be um, 458.5. Times 102.6 plus x is equal to 551.2. 551.2 times 20.0 plus x. Okay, then I'm going to multiply um, throughout there. So 458.5 times 102.6 gives me. Um, 47,042. So I've got 47,042.1. I'll fix the sig figs at the end. Actually, we don't, have, these wanted us to report it to three sig figs, so I don't have to fix it at the end. So 47,042.1 plus 458.5x is equal to 551.2. 551.2 times 20 is um, 11,024 plus 551.2x. Okay, then we're going to combine the x. So let's subtract 458.5x from both sides. So I'm going to take 551.2 minus 458.5. Point, oh shoot. 551.2 minus 458.5. 458.5 is us 92.7. And so we'll put an, uh, X on one side here. I should let me do this. Let me scroll down. A little bit more room. Come on. Okay, so I get ninety two point seven X is equal to, okay, then I subtracted 458. Now I'm going to subtract 11,000 from both sides. So 47,042.1 minus 11,024. Oh, come on having trouble with my calculator minus 11,024, 36,018.1, 36,018.1, and then divide both sides by 92.7 to get X. So divided by 92.7, 388.5. Five, four. So um, if I report this to three sig figs, X is equal to 389. Um, X is three, it's supposed to be 273. So I'm a hundredth off, you know, I'm pretty far off. It's pretty bad. And the percent error is gonna be kind of big. 
it's going to be 389 minus 273 um, equals divided by 273 times 100. It's a huge error. That's 42% error. It's bad. Um, but that's the data we got, we got, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, when it was being transferred, you know, um, I don't wear gloves when I did do this because I need to provide a good seal on the um, tube. But, um, but uh, in that case, the, my assistant was wearing gloves, so maybe some air leaked in there, not enough water got sucked in. So that could account for such a huge error. Or maybe I screwed up the calculation, you know, but that's an enormous error because it should be 273, you know. Hopefully trial two went better. And so that was one thing I was a little bit worried about was that, um, the seal wasn't as tight as it should have been. But this type of stuff happens, so I got to um, make it realistic because, you know, um, making it more realistic, if I did it, if you do it perfectly, it doesn't really, um, doesn't make you think about things that could, could have gone wrong. But I, I already know trial two went a lot better because um, it was too little water that got sucked in. So I already knew there was too little water. Only 92 milliliters getting sucked in was not enough water. Um, based on my experience with this experiment. And so the second trial went much better. So let's see what, what you, you got for the second trial. The expected value for this, for X, is 273. That's the expected. This is, you know, what, the expected is what we call the theoretical value, you know. Theoretical value. This is the experimental value up here. Both of these, even though these are calculations, this is based on experimental data. So. Okay. This algebraic, um, next we're gonna look at the graphical determination of this. It's recording still, fortunately. Graphical determination of absolute zero. Absolute zero is the temperature at which an ideal gas is zero volume. You will determine that this temperature in Celsius graphically by extrapolating your experimental obtained data experimentally obtained data. Use the blank graph on the following page to construct a graph. For trial one, locate and draw in your data points T1, V1. Your temperature should be reported in terms of degrees Celsius and your volume should be in terms of milliliters. Next, locate and draw the second data point um, T2, V2, also from trial one. Use a ruler, um, join these two points in a straight line, extending the line um, to intersect with the temperature axis. Label this line trial one, read and record the temperature at this intersect. This is the temperature at which the volume of air is theoretically zero. On the same graph, repeat, okay, so we're gonna repeat it, drawing it on the same. So we're gonna have two lines on one graph. So here's the graph here. Rotate this. Shrink it down. Okay, um, hopefully your graph paper came out a little better than mine. Um, mine, uh, you know, this is kind of a low resolution scan. I thought I, I thought I did a 400 or 600 DPI on this one, but it came out pretty bad. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna graph our two points. So let's make a little data table. And this, we're not gonna have anything up here. So I'm gonna make the data table up here. And so uh, let's see, data table should look like. So we'll have trial one. Um, Trial one, we're gonna have a T1 and a V1, and a T2 and a V2. 
And so I'm just going to call it hot and cold. And so um, we'll have T, V, and um, we're going to put the hot one, which is, we started off with hot, and then we cooled it, cooled it down. We'll get the cold. The, the temperature of the hot was 102.6, and the volume of the hot was 551.5. 551.5. Now, data table like this, we can put the units here. This would be units of degree C, although it's, it's really hard to see. This is units of milliliters, so we don't have to put the units down in the actual in the actual data if we have it in the heading. So this is just slash degree C. This is slash milliliters. And so we're going to graph. This is um, data point one. So we're going to go to 102.6, which is just past 100 here. And we look at the blocks. Uh, although this is very hard to see, this is in blocks of five. So this is 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 100. So it's in blocks of five. And so we're at 500, we're going to go with 552. So, um, well, actually, 102.6. So we're going to go with 103. And so that's uh, a three. Um, three fifths of the way to the first block, or let's see, no, three tenths, no, three fifths, something like that. 103, 103. The first block would be 105. And so, yeah. So let's see. And the, um, the volume is 552. So here's 500. And so, what, how many blocks do we have? I think we have 10 blocks. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, ten. And so this would be five, ten, five, twenty, five, thirty. So we're at five fifty. We're just slightly above five fifty. So it's just slightly above the halfway mark, and just slightly past. You know, three, three out of five degrees. The first one's five, and so it's like right here. And so our first data points we're right about here. Let's say. Unfortunately, my my light lines didn't show up, and so you you probably can be a little bit more precise. And then we're going to pinpoint that with a dot and then circle it or make an X. But um, I'll just prefer a dot and circle dot like that here. Okay, that's data point one. Now data point two is going to be um, twenty uh, point zero degrees. Twenty point zero degrees C is the cold and then the volume of the cold was um i have volume of cold water so you got to be careful um on my data this is volume of cold air which was 551.2 minus 92.7 it's 458.5 so at 458, so we'll just call it 459. So it's almost at 460. So 460 would be the next block and it's at 20 degrees. So it goes um, 5, 5, 10, 15, 20. And then we're at 460, which would be the next line above halfway. So it's something like this. Unfortunately, again, my um, I can try to be a little bit more precise here. Again, it didn't um, didn't quite work out. Here, it's kind of hard to see. Um, it was 460, 458. This is 458.5. So 459, which is right below the 460 mark, which would be the next block above halfway. So this is probably a little bit too high. Let me fix that. So 20 is this one, and then 450 is here, 460, it should be right below 460. Can't really see this, unfortunately, but I'm guessing it's right here. All right, um, I drew this kind of dot kind of big because it's hard for me to see right there. This one, I think it's, it's more pinpointed with a little bit more accuracy, but I, I really can't. Um, judge that fairly. 
And then we got to get a straight edge, you know, we get a straight edge. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just draw a straight line through this. Try that. I tilt this. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't go out far enough. Um, we had such a huge error that it's out here. And so uh, the temperature is going to be um, less than minus 350 here. That's what it looks like. It's minus 350. And so, oops. We need to pinpoint where that is, you know. Yeah, I, I was thinking about repeating that actually when I was when I saw that volume, but didn't should have repeated it. You know, if we were doing the experiment right now, um, I would repeat it because this data is not good, but. Your trial two should have been much better anyway. Oops, let me try to select that. So it would be 400 out here. So it's around 390, you know, we can't get too precise there. Here you can get more precise. So your trial two, you should be able to more precisely estimate it here. But for our trial one, um, because we were off scale, um, we can only, we're not going to be too precise here in our measurement. And so in our measurement for the intercept, you know, this is where the volume goes to zero. Where the volume, you can't go below zero. So this is absolute zero. This is the coldest temperature we're going to get. And so um, here, we're just going to estimate it as minus 390 degrees C, you know, about, you know. Yes, I just made another block there, uh, um, the same length as that. Well, that, that kind of goes with our algebraic um, calculation. When we look at our algebraic calculation, unfortunately, the drawings are going to go up here. Actually, I deleted it. Um, our algebraic calculation was in that same ballpark range. Okay, what else do they want us to do with this? Um, come on. All right. Oh gosh, this is really sensitive. Uh, they want us to label this, right? And so we need to label this line as trial one. And then you're going to make another plot on here. Hopefully it's Hopefully it's a lot closer, you know. It should be 273, so we're expecting it around here, you know, minus 273 um, Celsius would be absolute zero. That's what we're hoping. Okay, so that's what you're gonna do. Uh, any questions on this? So you're gonna have to make the second plot. You can turn this in next week. Is it going by tens? On the vertical axis, yes. On the horizontal axis, is going by fives. Maybe it's going by tens. I I, I can't really see. I think they had. I'm I'm. I was seeing if they had a small line. If it's going by tens, then yeah, it would be ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. But I thought there was one more line in here between. So could be that. When I look at my graph papers, this is this is the graph paper I have. My print copy. And so my graph paper is a bit more um, precise here. 
it's going, my graph paper is going by fives on the horizontal. And so it's going by fives here. Uh, we can see it, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, all the way up to 100. And then on the vertical axis, it's going by tens. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 200. And so that's what I was assuming that this graph paper was doing, but I can't tell because the scan came out so bad, you know? Um, and so the, I got the, on my X axis, I have it by fives, not by tens, right? Professor, can you put this um, blank graph on uh, Piazza because I messed mine up. Um, the, you mean the graph paper? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, if, if, yeah, let me see. All right. Let me try to scan that into um, Piazza. Thank you. Sure. All right, we're going to leave this. So turn this in next week um, sometime. Just finish the calculations. Uh, the beginning of next week would be good. And make one more line on the graph. OK, let's move on here. Um, I think that was it for, yeah, that's it for that lab. Experiment four. Experiment five, conductivity. This is an interesting one. This is where you can measure the electrical conductivity. You know, ions are good conductors of electricity if they're mobile. I mean, we'll do some of that. This is an electrolyte lab. This is experiment six, um, but the numbering scheme got all mixed up. We did common um, chemical reactions. That's what we left off with. And so let's take a look at um, where we left off. We left off looking at the decomposition of um, copper two carbonate here. So let's take a look at that. I, uh, fortunately, nobody cleaned it up. And so this is the, the copper two carbonate was a light green, and then it formed copper two oxide. Copper two oxide is the black stuff here. We had copper two carbonate going to copper two oxide. It released CO2. So the CO2 was captured in this tube here, and then it was bubbled through, C, um, through what we call lime water. And the lime water actually dumped, it formed the white precipitate. All right, so let's uh, take a look at uh, what's happened with our reaction so far here. Um, All right, these are um, C. C1 was the zinc was added to copper two sulfate. So let's take a look at C1. It's been a week now. And so when we take a look at C1 here, you can see that um, there's no more zinc left at all. Take a look at the color. The color used to be blue. For the liquid, now it's totally colorless. And we have this 
solid at the bottom. That solid is copper metal. Um, small crystals of copper appear black. Um, and larger crystals are going to have that orange, red orange color. I don't know, it's hard to see that color, but there is some color in there. So that was pretty well reacted. Let's look at C2. C2 might look a little bit shinier, you know, but other, other than that, it's, nothing really happened. C2, there's still no reaction there. You can say no reaction, C2. C3, um, definitely a reaction here. It took place, I don't know why there's liquid in my beaker. Um, you can see that fuzz on there, so that's silver crystals growing on the copper metal. There, it looks like there's a little bit of copper left, but you can see that we had some shiny crystals there. Um, and then the solution turned blue. The, the solution used to be colorless, and now it's, it's getting this blue color to it. And C2. Zeke, one of my test tubes must have broke. Of liquid at the bottom of the beaker. C4. C4. Maybe I'll show a reaction in just one second. Copper and hydrochloric acid. Wow. Copper shouldn't. <laughs> Um, there's not much copper left. Do you see that? That's odd. Copper and hydrochloric acid shouldn't have given a reaction like this. That's very odd. So th this one makes me think there's something else um, uh, in this. Or maybe I used too concentrated hydrochloric acid. We'll come back to that. C5 was the zinc. Um, is added to hydrochloric acid. Here, um, we didn't have enough hydrochloric acid. And so this one had lots of bubbles, but we had too much zinc. And so all the hydrochloric acid is gone, stopped bubbling. And so that's excess unreacted zinc sitting at the bottom. And then we had the lead ones. Let's take a look at the lead ones here. We ignited the gas, yeah. We had lead with HCl. Lead with the HCl, uh, giving this nice white precipitate bottom of the test tube. Let's see, this white precipitate there stuck at the bottom. That's lead to chloride. And this one, there's nice crystals there, actually. You can see light, so they're a little bit sparkly in the light. And then um, with the chromate, we had the lead to chromate, which is giving these yellow crystals here. Pretty nice. Do you guys see this? Actually, I should share the video instead of that. Are you guys seeing this okay? okay. Yeah, all right. Um, I share the camera. Do you still see the camera? OK, 
Okay, so we're going to do zinc sulfate and hydrochloric acid um, comes next here, uh, which is going to be D3. Zinc sulfate and hydrochloric acid, D3. So <clears throat> try that. Uh, just one second. Okay, I'm going to do a couple of reactions here. Um, are you guys seeing the camera okay? Yeah, okay, good. All right, let's take a look at the next reaction. Here, try this. as big as it gets. Okay, so we're going to take some zinc chloride and some hydrochloric acid next. And so the, the general rule is we add acids. And so um, I'm going to get the zinc, the zinc sulfate. So I need a little transfer vapor for the zinc sulfate. Okay. And so the zinc sulfate get here. It's going to be a CCS clear colorless solution, okay, and then we're going to just leave. This is supposed to be about the same concentration, but this is actually much more concentrated. This is six molar hydrochloric acid. Okay, and so I'll just add it here. Let's see what happens. When we add acids, we always add it slowly, a drop at a time, because um, when we add acids to water, it's exothermic. And so we add it slowly because then the heat can dissipate. Water has a very high heat capacity, so it can dissipate in the water. And so it looks like um, not much heat was generated. Not much is happening. Um, when we mix these, there are different ways of mixing. You know, some people swirl it or try to swirl it. Um, other people just tap it. Usually just tapping it's okay. And so it, it resulted in a CCS, it looks like. Um, really, uh, no heat other than what heat might have been generated from um, the addition of the acid. And so uh, there's no reaction in this place, at least um, no visible reaction that's occurring here. Okay, so let me look at the next reaction.
my window closed, so I can't see where we're at. Let me try to go back to it. Well, okay. Um, so I'm going to label that. Was that D3? Okay, I'm going to put it in just a beaker to hold it. Okay, the next reaction we're going to look at is the reaction between Actually, now I see what happened here. This happens sometimes um, with old test tubes. Um, people slam these test tubes, you know, on, on the bottom of the beaker or, or wherever else. So what happens is it generates stress in the glass. And so what happened here was, um, this is, looks like zinc sulfate or, no, this was HCl, I think, one of those. And so the test tube broke and leaked all the contents into my beaker here. The beaker is filled with solution, unfortunately. So these these test tubes take a beating, and like this, you know, a mechanical beating, and eventually it's going to stress the structure, and so the next person to use it barely touches it and it cracks. And so this is why what we do sometimes is we anneal. You know, um, I usually uh, the start of Chem One B, I have all the students anneal their test tube. What annealing does is just softens up the glass a little bit to let the bonds, you know, what happens is the bonds get tweaked as you're hitting this. And as they get tweaked, the angles get stressed. And by heating this up, you, you allow it to soften a little bit and then it relaxes the angles so that they can go to a lower energy angle and aren't as susceptible to breaking. And so annealing is a very important process when you're working with glass to uh, remove residual stress in the structure. All right, well, it's two o'clock now. So what we're gonna do, let's take a break because I gotta find the, um, I gotta find out how I'm gonna bring up that um, PDF again, and then we'll start again, okay? All right, so I'm going to stop it here. All right, so I have the ammonia in a little dropper bottle. So this is reaction E1. Reaction E1 is the iron three chloride and ammonia are mixed. So let's try that. The ammonia is a CCS. So I'll just put a drop of ammonia in there and see if anything happens. Nothing appears to be happening. Um, I think, you know, with the HCl and the ammonia, nothing much was happening there either. I think my, the ammonia has gone flat. You know, ammonia is a actually liquid, um, not a liquid, but it's actually a gas. So if you have a gas in there, it can go flat. One way you can tell is you can um, smell this. When you smell chemicals, you don't want to hold it, you know, right below your nose. Um, because if you hold it right below your nose, you get too much. So what you do is you try to walk the vapors towards your nose. See if you can detect any odor of ammonia. You don't want to do this with HCl because HCl is much more corrosive, but I don't smell any ammonia. This ammonia is probably too old, so it's gone flat. And so this is E1. I'm going to get, uh, I have to get the fresh, fresh ammonia. And so give me a moment, I'll be right back to look for some fresh ammonia.
Okay, I'm back here. And now, um, now I got a, another bottle of ammonia. So let me check this bottle. And so I'm gonna take off the lid. I'll hold the stopper in my hand and then just waft the vapors towards my nose. And this one has a very powerful odor. I, if I held this below my nose, it would have, it would have been very strong. Yeah, whereas this one, I can't smell anything from this. So this has probably gone bad. It's probably, it's, all the ammonia is probably gone. This water's left. And so I'm going to um, pour some fresh ammonia into the dropper bottle. Here. And uh, let's retry this reaction here. This is a reaction of iron three chloride and ammonia. This dropper has a leak, so spilling. So what I'm gonna do is this dropper is not very good. I'm gonna just pour it. Okay, now we definitely see something happening there. What you see is a, um, a precipitate that's on the top there. Uh, let me mix this. Okay, sometimes it's, it's hard to mix. Um, and so what we can do, well, my stir rod. What we could do is we could also use a stir. What, what's happening is just the precipitate. Um, the precipitate's not very dense. And so the precipitate's not sinking to the bottom. And so I have some unreacted iron three chloride there. And so if you really want this to make sure it's completely um, mixed, then we could use a stir like this. The problem with using a stir is that we have to clean the stir. That's it. And so it's nice just to be able to shake it up mix it that way. And so the precipitate here is this, um, you know, orange brown precipitate. And eventually this precipitate will settle to the bottom. And so when we mix the iron three chloride, you can see it's settling there. And so this is E1. You got a precipitate from that. Rinse off the stir rod with some DI water. We usually, if you don't have a, usually we can rinse it into a waste um, beaker. It's nice to have a waste beaker near your station. Okay, the next reaction is going to be E2, hydrochloric acid and sodium carbonate solutions, or solid sodium carbonate. So let me get some solid sodium carbonate. So here's my um, solid sodium carbonate. It's, it's actually a hydrate. This is a monohydrate and um, it looks dry. This is one thing that I've got. And so I'm gonna use a spatula or a scoop to transfer it. In this case, I'll just use a spatula. I'm gonna crush up some crystals here. All right, again, we add the acids. And that way um, it's better, better control a little bit. And so I'm gonna just put some sodium carbonate into the test tube. You want to be? Get a piece here. So I got some sodium carbonate in there. And then I'll add some um, hydrochloric acid to that. This is a hydrochloric acid. I'm not gonna smell this one because hydrochloric acid is pretty corrosive. And so let's see what happens when I add the two together. And so lots of bubbles form. And so we get, we're getting a lot of effervescence there. The gas that's forming is a CCG, 
clear colorless gas. I'm going to add excess HCl. When you add acids to carbonates, it usually it's just going to form CO2. All right, if you look carefully, there's no more solid left in there. You know, we just have a lot of foam here from the bubbles. So. Okay, so pretty much all the solid was eaten away. Maybe there's a little bit left, but eventually that's gonna go too. And um, what we're going to be left over with is just a CCS and a CCG. The CCS is a clear colorless solution. And the CCG is a clear colorless gas. The gas is CO2 gas formed here. All right, so this is E2. So I'm going to label this with a Sharpie, just right on the glass. E2. So. <laughs> go to the next reaction. All right, th that's all the reactions. So those are our observations for um, experiment, the common chemical reactions experiment. So let's go back up here and then um, take a look at Get some of the equations that we'll have. Let me move this window out way here. <clears throat> okay, so here we're going to include our observations of the reactants before and after mixing. And then um, we want the balanced chemical equation for this reaction. And so this one I already did on the board. And then let's work on um, this one here. This is uh, pretty much the same balanced chemical reaction here. So. Why don't you work on um, the balanced equations for these for right now? And then um, I'll interrupt you. I'm gonna wheel in the next experiment. And so we're done with this, uh, at least the collecting the experimental data for this. So we'll take a look at the equations and um, try to work on some of these equations here. Let me, um, while I set up the next lab. Let's see, which one will we do? I think what we'll do is um, we're gonna do the titration lab next, and then we'll do the, um, we'll do the next chemical reactions lab. Okay, so I'm gonna set up the uh, titrations lab. So just take a look at the equations for right now. I'll be right back.
Okay, we're going to get started again here. And um, we're, we're going to jump to the titration experiment. Um, 